Welcome to the Circularity Edge podcast, where we discuss the latest news and perspectives on the circular economy and issues relating to social, environmental, and economic sustainability. Join us every week when we discuss what's needed to create a sustainable circular economy worldwide. Now, here is your host, Ken Alston. Hello, this is Ken Alston with the Circularity Edge podcast, and today we're taking a look at fashion and one of the missing pieces for closing loops in textiles. Some of you may know that I have a direct personal link to the textile history going back a long way. My father worked in um, a rayon mill in the northwest of England, and I actually had my first summer job there in that same factory, so I, I've seen um, certain logics from the from the inside from a very early age and um, more recently in 2015 i was in shanghai china teaching cradle to cradle design principles to the staff of a major european fashion retailer and so <clears throat> that brings my fiber excuse me my fiber and um, textile experience sort of up to date and my guest today is firmly in in the um renew and restore part of textiles in the circular economy. Uh, please welcome Tricia Carey, the Chief Commercial Officer of Renew Cell. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Ken. Pleasure to be here today and a great way to start off the new year in a conversation with you. Well, thank you. So let's talk about Renew Cell. When I first looked at your website, there were four big words right there staring at me in the face. We make fashion circular. It's a big, bold statement. Tell us a little bit about what that means to to the company. Yeah, you know, we make fashion circular, I think really puts together the action and the ambition that we have as a company. So Renew Cell is a fast growing Swedish based textile recycling company. So we take textile waste and we convert that into pulp, which is then used um, by fiber producers around the world. And uh, we're at a point where we're scaling up now after 10 years, and we're using our unique technology and our world-class team of people on this mission to really change the global textile industry. And with that, we plan to recycle the equivalent of more than 1.4 billion t-shirts every year by 2030. So this, this ambition we have, and we're well on track to achieving some of these goals around making fashion circular. So when um, you mentioned you have a number of input fibers, what, what would they typically be? What, what, are the, what are the fibers you can take? Yeah, so in taking textile waste, um, right now our specifications are that we need 95% cellulose in order to recycle. So cellulose being uh, cotton, or it could be viscose, modal, lyocell, uh, right now, we're focusing on cotton, and that's because the basket of fibers that are available and the textiles that are available in cotton. Um, typically, in textile recycling, people are in the two camps between synthetics and cellulosic, and then you kind of take it from there and the innovations that are coming off of those. Um, and it could be mechanical recycling or chemical recycling. Uh, so what we're using as feedstock is textile waste using 95% cellulose. And when I think about, you know, the last more than 20 years that I've been teaching the design principles of what we now call the, the circular economy, it was always a frustration that you'd go around the the typical, you know, use cycle of a, of a product. And you come to that point at the end when it's whatever it is you're talking about is no longer usable. <clears throat> and you want it to come back in some way, shape or fashion or, or to be mended or, you know, however you're going to bring it back and reutilize it at some point in the process. And there was always this, I, I literally called it the black hole, right? It, it was, there was nothing there. So how did, how did the companies sort of come upon that black hole as it were and, and decide that that was where they wanted to play? Yeah, well, a little bit of history around Renew Cell. It was founded by inventors from Stockholm's KTH Royal Institute of Technology, and that goes back to 2012. 
Um, so I would say from there, it was understanding around how this technology, you know, and with the basis, when you look at the history of what's in Sweden and the, the strong history back to the, the wood pulp mills that are there, right? So you have a lot of intellectual property of people and systems and companies to understand the pulp industry. So from 2012 and around 2014, then um, actually in partnership with designers and fabric manufacturers, Renew Cell created the world's first 100% chemically recycled garment. And this is our iconic yellow dress that we often talk about in different presentations. From there, uh, it was around 2017, 2018, uh, there, we actually established our um, our uh, demo plant, and this is in Kristinehamn in Sweden. So from there, we could start to work on more of the developments. And then 2019, 2020 is when we started to see Circulose Pulp. Circulose is the brand name for our pulp. So Renew Cell being the company and the product that we produce is Circulose Pulp. Uh, in 2019, 2020, that's when we started to ship it to fiber producers, um, many of which in the man-made cellulosic fiber industry are based in China. Uh, and we started to work with companies like H&M and Levi's, where we started to have um, some developments with those companies. And then it was in the end of 2020 that RenewCell went public on the um, stock exchange. So from there, that's when we started to have um, a working more towards the investment of our current production plant, uh, which is in Sundsvall in Sweden. Uh, it's just north of Stockholm. And we opened the plant uh, in 2020. Um, so end of October, we had our um, certificate uh, to, to produce. And we actually had our first shipment on December 29th of 2022. Um, our first containers were shipped. And uh, so this is just a little bit of our 10 year history and where um, you know we plan to go. Uh, right now, our production facility is 60,000 tons in Sudensvall that we started with. But what we saw, back to your question, sorry, that was a long answer um, so far. Back to your question around, you know, this closing the loop, how are we addressing what's missing and as you rightfully said, you know, you talk about you couldn't actually get everything back into the loop. And it's the collectors, sorters, pre-processors, and processors that were missing to bring it back in. Um, and I think, you know, collectively as a textile industry, we sat there kind of saying, well, we've been linear for so long and it was working. And then, and then this linear model just kept getting cheaper and cheaper and chasing the lowest cost producer. Right. I mean, we were talking before, you know, textiles 20 years ago, they were they were so much more expensive than where they are now right. and and the quality that was there. So with this, it was how do we use the assets of the resources that we have in order to bring this back into the loop and to have the raw materials at a quality level that are matching to current materials of wood pulp. Right. And that's what you want to have. You don't want to be circulating something that's going to have a shorter lifespan because the quality is impacted. So quality is definitely key in this whole conversation. Well, I'm glad you said that, because one of the things that I always stress when we're talking about the design principles is the existing traditional design principles of cost performance and aesthetics don't go away. It's not just because right. you're doing something that's more sustainable or more circular you didn't just push aside all those other things. So, you know, a quality, you're just adding new dimensions of quality to the quality equation, right? And saying it needs to be also more sustaining as well. Exactly. And where you can bring circularity into the quality equation is so important, right? Um, so in those design principles, designing that it could be disassembled and recycled, uh, and this is where I think the challenge and the shift that has to happen within the industry is to start to look at that. 
you know, if designers are starting to develop new fabrics, how can, how are they actually thinking of what can be recycled? And this is all the systems thinking that's developing right now in the industry, which is super exciting to have all of this change happening in textiles. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of reading on systems thinking and, and integrating it in my teaching because you're right, this, this is the big change from the traditional science approach of deconstructing things and being specialists and, you know, thinking that A plus B plus C makes whatever it is, but it doesn't work like that. It's much more interconnected and, and much more complex than, than we've, we've really treated it so far. It's so in, in, your, in your work, in your work, have you, do you, do you just rely on other people to do the collecting and say, hey, we're here to take it? Or are you actually involved in that initial collection part as well? What, what's important for Renew Cell, and I think the secret to our success, uh, is that we've been very focused. Um, and so being very narrow in this niche of we are making the pulp, and that is our mm -hmm. business model. So we are not collectors, we're not sorters. We collaborate with collectors and sorters. And there certainly are a lot of initiatives, especially in Europe, um, that have started around this because Europe is much further along in policy than we are here in the U.S. Um, so we collaborate with collectors and sorters because certainly that communication has to happen on what we need in order to, uh, you know, process for our production. But for Renew Cell, it's being focused on the pulp. Um, Circulos pulp, um, building that and scaling it, um, you know, quickly. And because this is what we see is, is needed in the industry. So how, um, how does the pricing, how does the pricing compare with conventional? Yes. Cellulose? Well, and this is always a question with circularity that comes in is around pricing. And, um, you know, we are, we are not at the same price as conventional wood pulp, which has been around for years. Uh, and a part of it is we have more players that have to get involved. It's not just looking at, you know, the timber as an input. Now, again, we have to support the collectors and sorters in order as our raw material providers. So there is a price premium um, for uh, circulose pulp. But what we see is as we continue to scale and our mission, our vision for what we're working on is to get to 360,000 tons of pulp. By 2030, this is what we've stated, and you can find this on our website. Right now, we just opened the 60,000 ton plant. Uh, we will be building and adding on to that with another 60,000 tons. So that's 120,000 tons of pulp, which otherwise would have been coming from trees. Right. Uh, so, I have to remember you know, that there's, you know, when we go with the tree route, that you've got probably 60 or 70 percent of the tree that's wasted, right? The lignin part of the tree isn't part of your cellulosic process. Exactly, right. So there's some differences in, in how resources are being used. Um, and you know what we're looking at is supporting the man-made cellulosic market. And if you looked at all the fibers that are produced in the world, it's about 110 million tons of fiber, right? Majority of that is synthetics. If you look at it, it's probably about 60, 65% is synthetics. Um, about 25% of that is cotton. Um, Man-made cellulosic is four to 5%. So it's about 7 million tons of uh, fiber that's produced every year. Uh, that is man-made cellulosic. That's your viscose modal lyocell acetate. Um, and then there's other oh. new innovations that are coming on. So we- I mean, is, it, is, it ultimately, is it ultimately the, the anticipation that the fibers that are made from your um, circulars can also come back as input materials yes. into your process? Exactly. Is so it can be recycled back into um, our process. Of course, that all depends on how it is utilized in the rest of the supply chain. What else is it blended with? So again, back to the systems design thinking, that's where we need to work with designers and continue to educate. Um, but yes, it can be, we've done tests on that and it can be recycled again. So it's from hundred percent recycled materials. It's recyclable going, going forward. So we're addressing the input and the output part of that. Um, and, uh, you know, man-made cellulosics are also biodegradable and not contributing to marine pollution like you have with synthetics. 
Yeah, I wrote a short piece on LinkedIn just between the Christmas and the New Year, thinking about what I call endings and beginnings since it was the end of the year and the beginning of a new one. And I was focused on language, on recycled, recyclable, and recycling, or or you know, put sustain in there or circular before the the endings of the words. Because I think I think it's time to move past the era of just recyclable or sustainable, meaning it's able to if somebody bothers to do it, right? But just yeah. because it's able to be, it doesn't mean to say it actually is, right? And so I think this is what I like about what you're doing is you're you're taking that action step of changing from just being recyclable in principle to actually recycling in practice. Exactly, exactly, Ken. You you hit the nail on the head there. And I think a lot of this language is something that we need to continue to work on. And I mean, remember when people just started to talk about sustainability and what did that really mean? Um, And now that's just an overused word. I'm looking forward to what happens with the green guides here in the US. The FTC is looking to update the green guides um, and I hope the industry input there can create the change that's needed and uh, the, the sense of education as well. Yeah, it's difficult because sustainability is such a big topic. And um, you know, when I see, and I've seen as you probably have in the, in the US, advertisements for, um, let's say sportswear uh, or leisure wear, where it's taught that it's it's sustainably made. Well, what does that mean? I know darn well it isn't sustainably made it, by any yeah. definition I would have. <laughs> you know, um, so yeah, there's a lot of greenwashing still going on. I'm doing a lot of work today, and um, I, I've got a new course that I'm I'm creating with a a, a collaborator in, in the UK, Rachel S. Can who has been doing sterling work um, in bringing people together at small and medium-sized enterprise level um, to help them understand sustainability sustainability and circularity in a deeper way. I mean, one of the things I talk about a lot is that I think we, what I call simplistic sustainability. Okay, you got the concept, but there's a huge gap between the concept and the real world. And, There's and people a can huge... talk all day long about concepts and, and have yeah. no sense of reality. Oh, for sure, Ken. I mean, the complexity around circularity. And I think, um, you know, when people talk about even sustainability, they think more about the planet. But really, and what we see the shifts in circularity as a, as a part of looking at sustainability is also the shifts from a social standpoint. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I always feel that the social side is overlooked, uh, and and yet it, it shouldn't be, you know. And that's where even within circularity, and when we talk about um, some of the textile waste, uh, and and where systems had already been created to utilize some of that waste, and now we have new waste streams that that can go into. What is that impacting on a social side um, yeah. when we look at it globally? So circularity can. Yeah. Yeah. And I always say, and again, this I think is such an important, to me, it's a basic thing, but people don't understand that circularity or circular economy and sustainability are two completely separate things. And yeah. just because you're circular doesn't mean to say you're sustainable. You can be completely unsustainably circular. Yes. And so I think there's even at that level, there's a lot of, you know, misunderstanding or lack of comprehension. Um, and I, you know, Rachel and I, we're talking about what we call real circularity, meaning it's the combination of circularity and sustainability, which brings back in the social piece that you were just talking about. Right. You can you can have you know an economic circularity without any any anything else in it. And one of the things that we're we're, we're covering with the SMEs that we're working with is that you know I like to say that you know you, you probably know this our common future the report of the United Nations from 1987 which is where sustainable development was first introduced. So that's now almost 36 years ago. And everybody quotes the same common definition of sustainable development, which is on uh, page 43, chapter two. Uh, but they, they miss the concept because they, right. only, they only quote the, um, you know, meeting the needs of the, of the current generation while, um, current needs while, 
not compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And that's it. And that's how people talk about sustainability. And the very first concept that is right below the next line, people have never even read this book. They don't even know what sustainability is, even though they claim to. Yeah. The first concept in sustainable development is the concept of needs, in particular, the essential needs of the world's poor. So it's talking right. completely about the social situation as the first thing. And it's only the second concept, the second bullet, which is more about the, the materiality and, you know, things to do with the planet. And, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree. The, there's a complete um, lack of real, real knowledge about what sustainability is and isn't. But, you know, we, we all do our thing, and right? One step at a time, we, we make progress. Um, exactly. I mean, I think that, and that's what it's about, Ken, when you say around progress, you know, and where the industry is today, where it needs to go. I mean, we even know within Renew Cell where we're at today, where we want to progress over the next, you know, within this decade. Um, but I think the framework for that and in, in taking what you were just saying, around the um, sustainable development goals of the UN it does give everyone that picture of where they need to continue to drive forward and that sustainability within the 17 goals um, can at least give that that sense of the direction that's needed. Yeah, we could have a whole 10 podcast or 17 podcasts on each of the 17 goals and <laughs> we could. be, be here, here to the end of the next century if if uh, if our bodies allowed it to stay that way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> are there more measurable lower inputs from, from your process? Where, where do you think the strengths are uh, apart from the, you know, the actualizing of the, the bringing back of materials? Yeah, bringing back the materials that they could be recycled again, right? Um, I also see that there's, you know, the the um, lower impacts, and we will be completing an LCA study, um, a full LCA study off of our new production facility. So a, a lot of it is based on estimations, but also when you look at water um, chemical savings, and it's also what how we're impacting the next step of of what's being produced. So the fiber producers and how it's a savings to them. Um, so overall, you know, I, I think it's very robust because you can look at reducing waste from landfills. You can look at water chemical energy savings um, and taking it further from there. Is it still pretty chemically intensive though? You know, the viscose process originally, you know, was fairly chemically intensive. Yeah. So in the viscose process, which we're not a part of because we're only making the pulp for those viscose producers. Mm -hmm. But um, I think there there's been a lot done to clean up um, the viscose market. And there's certainly have been a lot of NGOs that have been looking at this um, changing markets being one of them. Uh, they did a, a campaign on dirty viscose. They have a recent campaign on Synthetics Anonymous, which is also very a, a very good one to take a look at. I don't know if you saw that latest report in December, but uh, within the viscose man-made cellulosic fiber industry, uh, you know there are different levels. So lysol production, which came on 30 years ago, uh, and we were we were talking earlier about Cortals and uh, what what they were involved in, right. and. So the lyocell production process is a closed loop one. Um, so there you're actually reusing the solvent, which is different than the viscose, which is I equate it to more like a flat line where those chemicals need to be treated. Um, but again, that's not renew cells right. for business. The, We're the next on piece the along. The next yeah, piece along. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, within your process, are there other are there waste streams that you've been thinking about in a circular way to, you know, even, even as you're doing what you're doing, you may have some waste that how can they also become circular, whether it be in your own process or somebody else's? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great question, Ken, um, because there's a lot of innovation happening between synthetic, uh, what's happening with synthetics recycling and what's happening in cellulosic recycling. And then it's hard because you're never going to have 100% pure, right? I just said our specs are at 95%. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, we will have 5% of other fibers. Some of them could be synthetic. 
And synthetic recyclers, they have some cellulosics. So I think, you know, and this is where there is within this innovator space, some crossover. Um, and I'm really happy to see just how much we all do communicate with each other and say, well, this is where we're at. We're going to have, you know, some, some waste here, some other byproducts. Maybe you can use them. What do you have? Um, and I think that will develop over time as more technologies continue to ramp up. So there, there are some that we're looking at that we would have as byproducts. But first and foremost for us is to get our production up and running at, uh, at a speed and consistency that we need for the market. Right. And obviously it's, it's nice to do as you've done in your early stage when you're first ma making material to, to take an H&M or a Levi's or whoever and, and you know, make, take an iconic brand and show that you know, high quality um, <clears throat> textiles can be, and garments can be made from your, your materials. But how, how does that spread into the smaller end of the market to all the SMEs that I've been talking to? Yeah, there, there are yeah. Lot, there are a lot of individual smaller designers who, you know, have the heart and the head for sustainability and circularity, but they feel like they can't access the yeah. sort of things that you're doing. No, it's great. And, it you know, we started off with working a lot with H&M and Levi's. And yes, those are larger global brands. H&M uh, happens to also be an investor for Renew Cell. We work very closely with them. Um, Levi's, I think there it was also showing this denim to denim recycling that can happen because we do use a lot of denim inputs. So it was it was showing that things could be done at that scale and at that price point, too. But then we have worked with some smaller uh, companies uh, like Philippa K, Gianni, uh, uh, Pangaea, and we continue to want to, I mean, we, it, definitely within the strategy of, of commercialization, you have to work not only with the mass market to right. scale, but we have to look at those innovative uh, smaller companies. And so we do have a preferred partner program and here it's working with mills who will have it in stock. Um, and so then you have brands that can access it and the agreement that we have with those preferred partners, many of which are in Europe, um, is that they will produce at smaller amounts. So we're oh, just starting good. off. Yeah, we're just starting off with this program, but it's definitely one that we're looking to develop as we continue to scale so that materials are accessible at, in smaller quantities, as well as what's right, being right. custom produced for the larger brands too. Terrific. So what else would you like to talk about in the last few minutes here before we, we sign off the podcast? Oh, Ken, there's, you know, this is such a robust topic. There's so much that I'd like to talk about, but I also want to highlight, you know, some of the NGOs and associations that I think are very important for people to uh, work with and to um, also keep an eye on. Uh, Canopy Planet is one. They're around protection of forestry of ancient endangered and rainforests. Um, they've worked to been very supportive for Renew Cell and the growth of Renew Cell over the years. Um, so they're one to watch. They do come out with an annual hot button report. So I'd like to highlight that. Um, another organization that I'd like to highlight is Accelerating Circularity, which is um, an NGO that supports developments and trials on a regional level around circularity. Um, and this group started in 2019, so right before the pandemic and started uh, right here on the East Coast where we are and oh, right. looking oh, at uh, developments of what could be done and taking circularity from that regional concept. There's also a European chapter two of Accelerating Circularity. They come out with some great reports. You know, we need data. That's a big part of understanding this industry is, is what um, exists in, in data and understanding, you know, also chemistry as a part of that data too. So those are some areas. And I think overall, you know, what we're looking to accomplish um, over this decade is very ambitious um, at Renew Cell. Uh, and I'm a newer member to the Renew Cell team. I've only been there for a couple of months, but I have uh, decades of history in man-made cellulosic fibers. And, um, you know, this is where we need to continue at, a at the pace of which change needs to happen. Um, and that's that's very critical for what's needed in the industry right now. So these changes, um, it, you mentioned it before in our conversations, there's education that we need to have. We need to look at policy 
um, and supporting policy that will bring on the change, especially to circularity. And, um, you know, this is definitely, as we say it, accelerating circularity. There's, there's a saying that uh, it's a team sport. Um, and this collaborative network that needs to come together is essential. Well, and that's exactly what Rachel's doing in, in the UK, and I'm supporting her in every way I can because it's each of these little networks, wherever they pop up, wherever we can develop them, will ultimately all, coll all collaborate and connect, and we'll, we'll get that systemic overview that we, we know we need. Well, I'd love to put in the blurb that goes along with the podcast, um, you know, links to your website. And um, if you've got an image that you'd like me to associate with the, with the episode two, send that to me. And I am really wish you all very well for that next 10 years challenge of, of uh, scaling. Um, it's completely necessary. And, and thank you for being a part of that, that change. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate it. Wonderful to have the conversation today um, and where we're comparing our history and where we started. Um, I know we'll both see a lot of changes in this area. Very good. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Circularity Edge podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new, fresh weekly episodes. For more, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit our website at www.circularityedge.com. Until next time, bye Circular.